The subject of astrophysics began with the study of the stars. So this topic is old wine and old bottle. Besides, there are a number of people in this room, I can see, who are more qualified to give this talk. I claim neither originality nor special expertise. I have organized this discussion into two parts. In the second lecture, I shall discuss some of the key ideas concerning neutron stars and black holes, including some which are very much in the news. In the spirit of some of the earlier lectures in this series, I shall not be technical. My objective would be the following. Extraordinary as it may sound, progress in understanding celestial objects <clears throat> was intimately linked with certain key developments in quantum physics. Not only these developments, but also the subject of stellar astrophysics is now standard textbook material. Then why pick on this topic? Well, it is my view that in a series uh, uh, such as this, it would be worthwhile to retrace the history of the development of some of the early ideas. But to appreciate the extraordinarily prescient ideas, one must transform oneself back in time to the early part of the 20th century, otherwise everything will appear self-evident. But the ancient Greeks thought that the sky was a dark shield, pierced in numerous places with tiny holes through which an outside fire shone. These were the stars. For many centuries after that, the nature of the stars did not attract much attention at all. It is interesting that even Galileo did not ponder about this very much. Around the time of Newton, a philosophical question that was much talked about was the following. Is our sun a star? Characteristically, Newton dismissed this question contemptuously by asserting, of course the sun is a star. According to him, the more relevant question was, why is our nearest star like the sun? It was typical of Newton's imperious attitude in science. But the philosophical school of thought that prevailed in subsequent uh, decades was not conducive to pursuing this question. The positivist philosophers who prevailed very much in, uh, in the Western world, according to them, it was in the nature of things that one will never know what the stars were. That is where things stood till 1814, when a young boy named Fraunhofer in Munich in Germany discovered that the spectrum of the sunlight discovered by Newton was traversed by thousands and thousands of dark lines. And the young boy painstakingly drew these lines. And the next step, of course, was to determine the wavelength at which these dark lines appear. The explanation of these spectral lines came in 1849, when Kirchhoff in Germany and Stokes in Cambridge argued that these dark lines in the solar spectrum arose due to the absorption of the continuum radiation from the interior of the sun by atoms which are present in the diffuse atmosphere of the sun. And thus began the exhaustive laboratory effort to identify the elements present in the sun. Soon it emerged that the outer layers of the sun and the stars were gaseous and made up of the same kind of atoms that we find on Earth. The philosophers were proved wrong. If this wasn't enough, a new element was found in the sun during a famous solar eclipse of 1868. This discovery was made not far from here in Guntur in Andhra Pradesh by a team led by the astronomer Royal, Sir Norman Lockhart. Poxon and other astronomers from the Madras Observatory set up by the East India Trading Company also participated in this momentous discovery. This new element was called helium, after helios, the Greek word for the sun. <clears throat> we must credit the next significant progress in the subject to J. Homer Lane, who in 1870 wrote a pioneering paper entitled On the Theoretical Temperature of the Sun Under the Hypothesis of Gaseous Mass Maintaining Its Volume by Its Internal Heat and Depending on the Loss of Gases as Known to Terrestrial Experiment. This was followed and amplified by several people, notably Lord Kelvin and Helmholtz in Germany. And the basic idea 
is that the sun and the stars are gaseous blobs held together by their self-gravity. The gravitational pressure is balanced by the pressure of uh, gas, and the assertion was that this pressure of the gas was to be calculated according to the ideal gas law, popularly known as Boyle's law. To remind you, the pressure of an ideal gas, according to Charles and Boyle, depends upon its temperature and density. Now, the differential equations that Lane uh, wrote down, uh, which was satisfied by the density and temperature as a function of the radius inside the star, were two principles, one of mechanical equilibrium and the other of thermal equilibrium. The principle of mechanical equilibrium asserted that the pressure at any point, internal point in the star, must be just sufficient to support the weight of the layers sitting above it. And the principle of thermal equilibrium of the star required that the temperature distribution inside the star is capable of maintaining itself automatically, notwithstanding the continuous transfer of heat from the center to the surface of the star. Now, this simple theory, which is given by that one simple equation, the principle of hydrostatic equilibrium, uh, predicts the following. It predicts that the sun, when it, as it radiates energy, it will contract. It will contract because the heat which supported it against gravity is leaking out, and therefore the star must contract. And curiously, as the star contracts, it will get hotter. The point is that the heat generated by the falling in of the material must be sufficient not only to replace the heat which is being lost by the star, but to raise the internal temperature to a higher value than it was before. This will be required because the gravity is stronger in a smaller star. Therefore, you have this very paradoxical result that as the star radiates, it will in fact get hotter and not colder. The major problems confronting this very simple but very elegant theory of the stars were following. In Lane's time, there was no evidence whatsoever that any star existed for which the perfect gas, uh, theory of perfect gas could be applied. Remember that the spectral lines discovered by Fraunhofer and exploited by Kirchhoff and the Stokes merely demanded that the outer layers of the sun be gaseous. The mean density of the sun is 1.4 grams per cubic centimeter, which is more than the density of water. And long before we reach this density, we know that terrestrial gases cease to obey Boyle's law. And at the same time, at the time of Homer, I mean uh, Lane, there was no reason to doubt that the mean density of the sun was not typical of the star. So there was a serious problem here. The second problem concerned the source of the energy of the sun. Lord Kelvin and Helmholtz asserted that the sun maintains its heat by continuously shrinking. As the sun shrinks, the gravitational potential energy released is converted to heat. This was their very simple uh, idea. While this was a very simple and elegant idea, there was a serious difficulty with this. And to understand this, let us make a small digression. One can estimate the stored thermal energy inside the sun, sitting here in this room, using a very powerful theorem in physics known as the Virial theorem. This theorem in this form was first derived by the great mathematician Poincaré and by Sir Arthur Eddington. And this theorem says that the stored thermal energy of the star is equal to minus one half the gravitational potential energy. Minus because the gravitational potential energy itself is negative, so to get the sign you have to put a minus sign. Now the gravitational potential energy of a spherical object of mass m and radius r is g m squared over r. And the thermal energy of n particles at a temperature T is 3 halves n k T according to Maxwell's distribution. And therefore, equating the two, you can immediately derive that the mean temperature of the sun is a million degrees. If you are slightly more sophisticated, you would estimate that the temperature of the center of the sun will be about 10 to 15 million Kelvin. Now, 
you can ask now that i know how much money i have in the bank and what is the rate at which i am spending this money i can estimate how much the money will last so this stored thermal energy of the sun being radiated at a rate of 4 times 10 to the 33 ergs per second which is the luminosity of the sun will last only for 10 million years but the geologists and the biologists already at the time of lord kelvin were very much bothered by this but lord kelvin assured them that they must confine the outlines of history to this period of 10 million years but as eddington put it kelvin's date of creation was treated with no more respect than archbishop usher's now the discovery of radioactivity at the turn of the last century and its immediate use for dating rocks and fossils soon gave a precise estimate for the age of the earth of 3 billion years or so. This led people to conclude that the sun must have been shining with the present luminosity not for 10 million years but something like 10 billion years. So here we see the first example of an important discovery in physics, namely that of radioactivity immediately being applied to in, a, in, a, in an astronomical context. The resolution of this problem had to wait till 1920 when Sir Arthur Eddington in Cambridge made a dramatic announcement. Now this is all very well known. Eddington said that sun radiates because it converts hydrogen to helium. It is found even in eight standard textbooks, even in India. But when the idea was advanced by Eddington, it was one of the most precious state, uh, statement, prescient statements in all of science. He announced it on the 24th of August in 1920, and according to Chandrasekhar, Eddington's address contains, and I quote, some of the most precious prescient statements in all of astronomical literature, and therefore I shall quote Eddington extensively. I quote, only the inertia of tradition keeps, us, keeps the contraction hypothesis alive, or rather, not alive, but an unburied corpse. But if we decide to enter the corpse, let us frankly recognize the position in which we are left. A star is drawing on a vast reservoir of energy by means unknown to us. This reservoir can scarcely be other than the subatomic energy, which it is known exists abundantly in all matter. We sometimes dream that man will one day learn how to release it and use it for his service. The store is well nigh inexhaustible, if only it could be tapped. There is sufficient energy in the sun to maintain its output of heat for 15 billion years. Aston has further shown conclusively that the mass of the helium atom is even less than the sum of the masses of four hydrogen atoms which enter into it. And in this, at any rate, the chemists agree with him. There is a loss of mass in the synthesis amounting to one part in 120, the atomic weight of hydrogen being 1.008 and that of helium just four. Now mass cannot be annihilated and this deficit can only represent the mass of electrical energy set free in the transmutation. We can therefore at once calculate the quantity of energy liberated when helium is made out of hydrogen. If 5% of a star's mass consists initially of hydrogen, which are gradually being combined to form more complex elements, the total heat liberated will more than suffice for our demands and we need to look no further for the source of star's energy. If indeed the subatomic energy in the stars is being freely used to maintain their great furnaces, it seems to bring a little nearer to fulfillment our dream of controlling this latent power for the well-being of human race or for its suicide. 1920. To me, this is one of the most spectacular predictions in the entire history of physics. One should remember that when this assertion was made by Eddington, the indication from Rutherford's laboratory was very tentative. Please remember that a helium nucleus does not consist of four protons. 
It consists of two protons and two neutrons. The neutron was to be discovered only in 1932, and the Eddington's uh, assertion was in 1920. But Eddington's ideas were not well received. Of course it wasn't well received. So let me quote Eddington again. I am not referring to the alleged transmutation of hydrogen to helium in the laboratory. Those whose authority I accept are not convinced by these experiments. To my mind, the existence of helium is the best evidence we could desire of the possibility of the formation of helium. I am aware that not, but many critics consider the conditions in the stars not sufficiently extreme to bring about this transmutation. The critics lay themselves open to an obvious retard. We tell them to go and find a hotter place. But his idea became better accepted by 1930s, particularly by the physicists, not so much by the astronomers. And in the mid-1930s, two very well-known physicists, Hans Bethe and von Weizsäcker, constructed a detailed theory of energy generation in the sun. Nearly 30 years later, Hans Bethe was to receive the Nobel Prize for this work. There is no doubt in my mind that had Eddington been alive at the time, he would have shared this Nobel Prize with Bethe. At any rate, he should have. Well, although physicists, the great physicists, were convinced of uh, the correctness of Eddington's idea, there was a missing link in the argument. If indeed hydrogen was being converted to helium in the center of the sun, then the sun must radiate very copiously elementary particles known as neutrinos. The existence of these particles called neutrinos was postulated by Wolfgang Pauli in 1933 in the context of a radioactive decay of the neutron, as indicated there. In the present context, we are not talking about the decay of the neutron. We are talking about the reaction where a proton and electron combine to form a neutron. But nevertheless, in this process also, this mysterious particle neutrino appears. These particles, neutrinos, are thought to be massless particles. They travel with the speed of light. These ideas have been slightly revised. But the important thing is they go through matter effortlessly. Now, these particles are so elusive that it took nearly 30 years to find them, and it was eventually found only in 1958. And in, in fact, that's the reason why uh, the Nobel Prize to Hans Bethe was delayed by nearly 30 years. To recall, Eddington died in 1944. Coming back to our story, if fusion reactions were indeed taking place inside the sun, then one can calculate the number of neutrinos emitted by the sun in a second and how many of them will actually reach the earth. It's a staggering number. It was therefore a matter of paramount importance to detect these neutrinos. If these neutrinos were not detected, this wonderful idea of Eddington must be regarded as airy speculation, as he would have put it. <clears throat> well. Uh, around 1968 or so, Raymond Davis began his search for the neutrinos from the sun, and a more than a decade later, a very careful experimentation, he was convinced that he had detected the neutrinos from the sun, and this result was extremely controversial. Over the years, period, people began to accept that he had, in fact, detected the neutrinos from the sun. But this only created an enormously more complicated problem, because it turned out that the number of neutrinos that Davis was collecting was one-third the number that you expect from standard theories of physics. Therefore, the initial reaction was to doubt Davis's experiment, of course, but he stuck to his guns. And there was much apprehension and soul searching for about 20 or 30 years, 25 years. Well, all is well now. Exactly two years ago, there was a spectacular resolution to this problem. Everyone was right. Davis was right. The stellar model builders were right. The nuclear physicists were right. Elementary particle physicists were right. But that's a different story, and we will not pursue it. Let us return to the interior of the stars.
having <coughs> settled, at least in his mind, the source of heat in the sun, Eddington drastically changed the ideas of Lane, Kelvin, and Helmholtz. In the earlier theory, which I had indicated before, it was supposed that the heat was transported from the center to the surface by convection, and the sun was continuously stirred up like the lower part of the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, it was an application of the theory of Earth's atmosphere due to Lord Kelvin to the stellar problem. Eddington abandoned this and he introduced the idea of radiative equilibrium. Looking back, this was a truly monumental step. The basic notion in radiative uh, equilibrium is that heat, in fact, is transmitted, transferred by radiation itself, and the temperature distribution is controlled by the flow of radiation and not by the flow of matter. Now, a key ingredient that Eddington introduced into the theory of the stars is the role of radiation pressure, an idea that had come into physics in the second half of the 19th century. In the earlier theories, which I indicated before, the inward pull of gravity was balanced by the pressure of an ideal gas. What Eddington said was that the pressure that balances gravity is the sum of the pressure due to the gas and the pressure due to the radiation. Now, radiation pressure in the domain of our experience is incredibly small, and one needs very delicate instruments to demonstrate radiation power, uh, pressure. But please remember that radiation pressure is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature, and given that the interior temperature of the sun is many millions of degrees, radiation pressure is by no means negligible. To illustrate, shown at the bottom, at a temperature of million degrees, the radiation pressure is 2,500 atmospheres. And at a temperature of 10 million degrees, radiation pressure is 25 million atmospheres. Now, if the pressure is partly due to material particles and partly due to ether waves, as it used to be called those days, so is the source of heat partly material and partly ethereal. Thus, in a star, one encounters for the first time a new situation we had never encountered before. <clears throat> Instead of heat being entirely due to the motion of particles, we now find that a large portion of heat itself is in the form of stored radiation. Let me quote Eddington again. These ether waves are hastening in all directions in the stars. They are encased by the material as in a sieve, which prevents them from leaking into outer space except at a slow rate. An ether wave making for freedom is caught and absorbed by an atom and flung out again in a new direction and passed from atom to atom. It will thread the maze for hundreds of years until by accident it finds itself at the confines of the star free now to travel through space indefinitely or until it reaches some distant world and perchance entering the eye of an astronomer makes known to him that a star is shining. What wonderful! This is not popular literature. This is his book. What a absolutely marvelous how he writes. Okay. Now, this leakage of radiation from the center to the surface of the star takes many hundreds of thousands of years, 500,000 years. And it is this leakage one wants to determine. To proceed further, one has to have a theory for the absorption of radiation and emission of radiation by atoms. Or we must have a theory for the opacity of the material of the star. Here again, Eddington showed his brilliance. He argued that at the temperature of several million degrees, radiation consists of X-rays, soft X-rays. Eddington advanced the hypothesis that the principal physical process contributing to opacity is determined by photoelectric absorption coefficient in the soft X-ray region, that is, by the ionization of the innermost K and L shells of the highly ionized atoms. 
Please remember, this was around 1918-1919. But he needed a theory, detailed quantum mechanical theory, for this absorption and emission of radiation. And in 1923, the famous Dutch physicist wrote his monumental paper where he calculated photoelectric ionization cross-section, and Eddington immediately pounced on it and applied it to the stars. So we see, just as he was quick to um, uh, accept the emerging ideas from Rutherford's laboratory to explain the source of the heat, Eddington uh, used Kramer's calculations to proceed further. Once again, a path-breaking development in quantum physics is being immediately invoked in an astronomical context. Incidentally, at first sight, it might appear that since the mean density of the sun is roughly the density of that water, matter cannot possibly be uh, very opaque. But this is not correct, because the, the sun is at a temperature of a million degrees. Sun material will be quite opaque, and you'll be lucky if you can see the tip of your nose. The mean free path of the photon inside the sun will be about half a centimeter, that's all. Once one had a way of calculating this leakage of radiation, as Eddington put it, it was a straightforward matter to go to that simple differential equation that I wrote down and calculate the luminosity emitted by the surface of the star per unit time. And it emerged from this very simple calculation that Eddington did that the luminosity of the star is determined only by its mass and not by its radius. This is extraordinary. You would think that given a certain amount of mass, the heat it generates depends upon whether the star is small or big. But the luminosity of the star is determined solely by the mass. And the little reflection tells us why. The principle of radiative equilibrium is very powerful indeed. It requires that the energy generated at the center must flow out. It cannot accumulate. And given a rate of energy generation and opacity of the stellar material, the star will adjust itself to precisely that radius such that the energy radiated by the surface per unit time precisely equals the energy generated at the center per unit time. This is absolutely magical. The second interesting result to emerge from this theory is that the luminosity of a star is proportional to the cube of the mass. Therefore, a star 10 times the mass of the sun uh, radiates 1,000 times the energy of the sun per unit time. Now, a comparison of this theory with observation from one of the very early papers as shown in this figure, and the solid curve is the theory that I have outlined and the points are the uh, observational points. The y-axis is the luminosity of a star, and x-axis is the mass of the star. At the extreme left is about one-sixth the mass of the sun, and the sun is indicated by the point 0.0, .0 on the x-axis. On the extreme right of the figure, you have a star which is 30 times the mass of the sun. I'm sure you'll all agree that this very simple theory is spectacularly successful. But there is a cause for worry, very, very serious worry. Because as Eddington put it, we have compared the theory with the wrong stars. Let us recall that the theory we have developed is for a perfect gas. I already remarked that the density of the sun is 1.4 grams per cubic centimeter. Star Kruger 60 here is denser than iron. And most of the stars on the left of the diagram have densities of terrestrial solids and liquids. Surely they cannot be gaseous. But what about the stars on the right? Well, they are certainly diffuse. The mean density of the stars over here is the density of the uh, air in this room. So there is no problem with these stars. But certainly all the stars on the left they are the wrong stars. We are comparing the theory with the wrong stars. Now, while on this topic, let me mention another controversy that was looming at this time, and that concerns the nature of giant stars. 
Albert Michelson had measured the diameters of some of the stars. The star Betelgeuse, for example, has a radius of 250 million kilometers compared to 1 million kilometers for the radius of the sun. So even if Betelgeuse is 100 times more massive than the sun, its density would be a million times less. It would have to be a million times less than that of the sun. And listen to Eddington's argument, absolutely marvelous. He said, if a star of such a huge radius had the density of the sun, then the force of gravity would be so great that light would be unable to escape from it. The redshift to the spectral lines would be so great that the spectrum would be shifted out of existence. The mass would produce so much curvature of space-time around the star that space itself will close up around the star, leaving us outside, that is, nowhere, I quote Eddington. In other words, if the, if the star Betelgeuse had the density of the sun, then it would be, as we would call it, a black hole. And before you read that, let me tell what Eddington said. Lest this argument should be regarded by our more conservative readers as ultra-modern, we hasten to add that it is to be found in the writings of Laplace. Laplace, 1798. A luminous star of the same density as the Earth and whose diameter should be 250 times larger than that of the Sun would not, in consequence of its attraction, allow any of its rays to arrive at us. It is therefore possible that the largest luminous bodies in this universe may, through this cause, be invisible. Extraordinary. Eh? 250 million kilometers. I don't know where Laplace got that number from. So there is no serious problem as far as the stars on the right of the diagram are concerned. So they can be regarded as gaseous. But let us come to the problem towards the left of the star, uh, left of the diagram. We were there, we were talking about stars whose density was that of iron. So you can ask the question, is it impossible for matter to have a density of iron and still be a perfect gas? Eddington says, there is no earthly reason why a perfect gas should not have the density far exceeding iron. Or it would be more accurate to say, the reason why it should not is earthly and does not apply to the stars. The sun's material I'm continuing to quote Eddington. Sun's material, in spite of being denser than water, really is a perfect gas. It sounds incredible, but it must be so. The feature of a true gas is that there is plenty of room between the separate particles. A gas contains very little substance and a lot of emptiness. Consequently, when you squeeze it, you do not have to squeeze the substance. You just squeeze out some of the waste space. If you go on squeezing, there comes a time when you have squeezed out all the empty space. The atoms are then jammed in contact and any further compression means squeezing the substance itself, which is quite a different proposition. In a liquid, the atoms are nearly in contact. The big terrestrial atoms, which begin to jam at the density near that of liquid state, do not exist in the stars. The stellar atoms have been trimmed down by the breaking off of the electrons. The lighter atoms are stripped to the bare nucleus of quite insignificant size. Consequently, we can go on squeezing ever so much more before these tiny atoms or ions jam in contact. At the density of water or even of platinum, there is still any amount of room between the trimmed atoms and waste space remains to be squeezed out as in a perfect gas. Our mistake was that in estimating the congestion in the stellar ballroom, we had forgotten that crinolines are no longer in fashion.
And so we conclude that the stars, regardless of their mass, are indeed gaseous stars, and therefore we have not compared our theory with the wrong stars. All this sounds so utterly trivial, doesn't it? But please transform yourself back to 1919. Niels Bohr model of the atom had been advanced only six years earlier, and it wasn't exactly universally accepted. Great physicists like J.J. Thompson ridiculed it. Others expressed grave reservations. It is against this backdrop that Meghna Saha advanced his theory of ionization of atoms. According to his theory, the ionization of atoms depends not only on the temperature of the gas, but also on the pressure, the electron pressure, to be precise. Now, we developed this theory not in the context of the interior of the sun, but to explain certain anomalies of abundances in the outer layers of the sun known as chromosphere, which is above the layer that we actually see with the naked eye. Now, this theory of Saha is a very straightforward piece of physics one paragraph worth in any textbook. But the important thing is not its sophistication, but to appreciate that Saha took the emerging ideas from atomic physics very seriously and applied it extensively to explain major puzzles in astronomy. And his theory was very quickly improved upon by Fowler in Cambridge and Milne in Oxford and Russell in Princeton and many others. And it, it soon became a big industry. I will return to the interior of the stars, but I think I would have been remiss if in a discussion of seminal ideas concerning stars, I had not at least mentioned the important contribution of Saha. Now let us return to the main theme of our discussion. As I mentioned earlier, the new ingredient that Eddington introduced into the theory of the star is that of radiation pressure playing an important role as an additional support to the star. The theory does not depend upon how the star generates the energy. Absolutely magical. It depends only on the mass of the star and the mean molecular weight of the material. We have already discussed how this simple theory is about, is able to explain the relation between mass and luminosities of the stars. Now we turn to a different question. It is an extraordinary fact that masses of all the stars in the sky and indeed in the universe are in an incredibly narrow mass range. This is astonishing since gravitation is a force drawing matter together. After all, gravitation is able to assemble a million, million solar masses into a galaxy and several thousand galaxies into a cluster of galaxies. So why are the masses of stars in an incredibly narrow range? The theory we have been discussing so far is able to explain this in a very natural fashion. I couldn't do better than once again quote from Eddington, this time from a parable of physicists who were in a cloud-bound planet. Now, I'll leave this table on, and I will quote. The outward flowing radiation may thus be compared to a wind blowing through the star, helping to distend it against gravity. The formulae to be developed later enable us to calculate what proportion of the weight of the material is borne by this wind the remainder being supported by gas pressure. To a first approximation, this ratio is the same in all parts of the star. It does not depend on the density nor on the opacity. It depends only on the mass and the molecular weight. Moreover, the physical constants employed in the calculation have been all measured in the laboratory and no astronomical data is required. We can imagine a physicist on a cloud-bound planet who has never heard tell of the stars, calculating the ratio of radiation pressure to gas pressure in a series of globes of mass 10 grams, 100 grams, 1,000 grams, 10 to the power n grams, which is column number one. 
The table shows the more interesting part of his result. The rest of the table before 10 to the power 32 grams and beyond 10 to the 39 grams, the table will consist mainly of long strings of nines and long strings of zero. Just for this particular range of mass between the 33rd and 35th globe, the table becomes interesting and then lapses once again to a long strings of nines and zeros. Therefore, regarded as a tussle between matter and ether, gas pressure and radiation pressure, this context is overwhelmingly one-sided except between the globes 33 and 35th, where we may expect something interesting to happen. What happens is the stars. We draw aside the veil of cloud beneath which our physicist has been working and let him look up at the sky. There he will find a thousand million globes of gas, nearly all of mass between his 33rd and 35th globe, that is to say between half and 50 times the sun's mass. The lightest known star is about three times 10 to the 32 grams and the heaviest about two times 10 to the 35 grams and the majority are between 10 to the 33 and 10 to the 34, where the serious challenge of radiation pressure to compete with gas pressure is beginning." Unquote. So if stars are objects where the inward pull of gravity is balanced by radiation and gas pressure, why should this happening of the stars, as Eddington put it, depend upon this tussle becoming interesting and not too one-sided. Eddington, as always, is eloquent, but very obscure. So to understand this, we must turn to young Chandrasekhar, who posed this question at a more fundamental level. And many of us in this room were privileged to listen to him speak on this very topic in this very campus 25 years ago. And I wish to recall for you his arguments. First, <clears throat> domains of natural phenomena are often circumscribed by well-defined scales. And the theories concerning these natural phenomena are successful only to the extent that these scales naturally emerge in them. So as Chandrasekhar put it, if you ask the question, why are the atoms as they are, as he did in faculty hall, the answer, because the Bohr radius, h bar squared by m e squared, provides a correct measure of their dimensions is opposite. So in a similar vein, one can ask, why are the stars as they are? intending by such a question to seek the basic reason why the simple theory of the stars prevails. This must be because, Allah Chandrasekhar, the theory of the stars we have been discussing, there must be a natural scale of mass that emerges. And that scale of mass must be of stellar magnitude. Now, Chandrasekhar isolated this uh, uh, mass scale from this very simple theory of Eddington. To do this, one has to recall a very basic theorem concerning the mechanical equilibrium of the star. And these details don't concern us. What matter? What this? What this says is that the pressure at the center of the star, which is the center of this inequality, must be less than the pressure at the center of a star whose density everywhere is the central density must be greater than the density of a star whose density everywhere is the average density. If you think about it a little bit, if this inequality were to be violated, the star would not be in mechanical equilibrium or hydrostatic equilibrium. So this is the content of this theorem. Now Chandrasekhar used this theorem to isolate the, let us look at the right-hand side of the 
uh, inequality, which is that the pressure at the center of the star must be less than or equal to rho to the power four thirds, where rho c is the pressure at the center and mass to the power two thirds. Now the pressure is the sum of gas pressure and radiation pressure. There are fundamental constants that enter into that. And you can juggle this inequality. It's a very elementary thing to do. And you can derive an inequality for the mass of the star in terms of the rest of the things that come in the equation. And what you see is that this very simple argument has isolated a combination of fundamental constants that enter into the theory and which has the dimension of a mass. Planck's constant multiplied by velocity of light divided by Newton's gravity constant to the power 3 halves divided by the square of the mass of the hydrogen atom or the square of the mass of the proton. This particular combination of fundamental constants that enters the theory has the dimension of a mass just as h bar squared over m e squared is the dimension of a length and it has its value is 29.2 solar mass. And therefore, Chandrasekhar concluded, we conclude that <coughs> to the extent our theory is at the base of the equilibrium of actual stars, to that extent, the above combination of natural constants providing a mass of proper magnitude for the measurement of stellar masses is at the base of a physical theory of stellar structure. Stars are as they are because hc by g to the power 3 halves into 1 over square of the mass of the proton provides a correct measure for their masses. To my mind, this is an extremely beautiful and powerful argument as to why the measured masses of the stars are in the range they are. Why you cannot have a star which is 100th the mass of the sun? Why you cannot have a star which is 1,000 times the mass of the sun, 10,000 million times? Why it has to be in this incredibly narrow mass range? Well, Chandrasekhar, when he discovered this, he sent a postcard to Dirac. He wrote a postcard. This thing was written in a postcard and sent it to Dirac, who thought it was interesting enough. He communicated to nature, and that is how this was published. <clears throat> Let us proceed. Now we come to the importance of uh, radiation pressure. I presume my time started counting when I started and <laughs> after the preliminaries were over. All right, now we come to the next important question, but before that, uh, I do hope that I've been, I was able to convey the importance of introducing the idea of radiative equilibrium. Listen to this. The mass of the sun, you, there you heard Chandrasekhar, very different style. Now you listen to Eddington. The mass of the sun is so many tons. I hope I have counted the zeros correctly. Though I dare say you would not mind if there is one or two, too many or too few. But nature does mind. When she made the star, she evidently attached great importance to getting the number of zeros right. All right. Now we come to the appreciating the role of the uh, radiation pressure in a star. One of Eddington's very important insight was not only to introduce the role of radiation pressure in a star, but in appreciating that as you go to more and more massive stars, the role of radiation pressure will get more and more important. Till finally, you could think of a uh, situation where the pressure of radiation is so large that it blows apart the star. Therefore, he argued that the luminosity of a star cannot be greater than a certain limit. Now, uh, uh, when Eddington said this, there was no proof that the stability of star depended on radiation pressure. Now, uh, you can take a, a little bundle of material anywhere in the star. You can calculate what is the gravitational force that is pulling it towards the center, which is due to the mass interior. And you can ask what is the outward push due to the radiation. And you can balance the two. And by balancing the two, you can immediately calculate the limiting luminosity of a star. 
which has now come to be known as the Eddington luminosity. This is another wonderful result in physics. It's a beautiful result because it says the limiting luminosity of the star is determined only by the mass of the star and fundamental constants. It's velocity of light, Newton's constant of gravity, what comes to the denominator is what is known as Thomson scattering cross-section, but that involves only the mass and a charge of the electron. The numerical value of this Eddington luminosity limit is 10 to the power 38 ergs per second for an object which is one times the mass of the sun. The sun's luminosity is 100,000 times less than this. But in the discussion of neutron stars and black holes, and indeed in much of contemporary astrophysics, this limiting luminosity of the star plays a very central role. And so now we conclude our discussion of these gaseous stars and move on to the next chapter of the story of the happening of the stars. And this story begins in the year 1924, and it concerns the companion of Sirius. Those of you who look at the sky, you remember Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. It is the faithful dog of Orion the hunter. In 1924, Walter Adams in America made a very important observation. He showed that this companion of Sirius, the Sirius had a companion, they're going around a common center of mass. This companion of Sirius was roughly the mass of the sun. There's no big surprise there. But the big surprise was that its radius was only a few thousand kilometers like the radius of the Earth and not a million kilometers, which is the radius of the sun. And therefore, the density, mean density of this companion of Sirius is not one gram per cubic centimeter, but 2,000 times greater than platinum, as uh, Walter Adams put it. Soon, other stars were discovered whose mean density was a million grams per cubic centimeter. Now, the extraordinarily brilliant thing in this observation was that Adams measured the radius of the star using an effect that Einstein had predicted in the general theory of relativity, namely that of gravitational redshift. The redshift of a spectral line depends upon the acceleration due to gravity, which depends on the mass and the radius of the star. So as Eddington put it, Professor Adams killed two birds with one stone. He verified for the first time the important prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity, and also established that a star can be 2,000 times more dense than platinum. But this discovery rattled Eddington. It really rattled him. And he's, the reason was the following. As he said, I do not see how a star which has got into this compressed condition is ever going to get out of it. It would seem that the star will be in an awkward predicament when its supply of subatomic energy fails. A star will need energy to cool well, this aphorism is really difficult to understand, isn't it? But this was stated in a more understandable language by Professor Fowler, a colleague of Eddington in, in Cambridge. Let us consider a gram of this stellar uh, material and ask what is its negative electrostatic energy, which is the energy of attraction between all the positive charges and all the negative charges. If you go and look in some undergraduate electrostatic books, you will find that the electrostatic energy is proportional to the square of the charge uh, number and density to the power four thirds. If you want to look at it, this is the sum of the total ionization energy to remove all the electrons and make it a completely ionized matter. Then you can ask, what is the kinetic energy per gram of this material? Kinetic energy per gram of this material is given by Boyle's law. It is rho t. NKT. Well, what Eddington meant was the following. If you take this compressed one gram of material from the companion of Sirius and you released it of this pressure, you can ask, will this piece of matter be able to resume its original state of normal atoms? And it can do so only if the kinetic energy is able to overcome the attractive potential energy. 
the gas should be able to escape to recombine. But if you take these formulae and take the density and temperature that obtain in the companion of Sirius, you discover the kinetic energy is very much less than the potential energy. Therefore, the star is doomed because it has no energy to cool. In order to cool, it has to expand. In order to expand, it must have kinetic energy, and it does not have this. Now, this paradox was resolved by Fowler in 1927 in terms of the then very new statistical mechanics due to Fermi and Dirac. Now, you remember there was a statistic that S. and Bose had discovered, which Einstein then applied to other substances like helium. But what Fermi and Dirac showed was the following. They said that if you are dealing with electrons, protons, neutrons, and particles like this, there is a new game, new rules of the game, which are determined by two of the underlying principles of quantum physics. One is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and the other is Pauli's exclusion principle. Heisen Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that you cannot measure the position and the corresponding momentum of the particle with arbitrary accuracy. An immediate consequence of this Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is that if I confine an electron to smaller and smaller volume, I can do so only by virtue of the electron acquiring greater and greater momentum. Now, this principle, uh, and Pauli's exclusion principle says that you cannot put more than one particle in a quantum state. If you are dealing with the energy eigenstate, you can put two particles if you make sure that their intrinsic angular momenta are not oriented in the same direction, but that's a matter of detail which we will not be concerned with. So if I have a collection of electrons, protons, neutrons, etc., according to this new rule, if I want to populate these energy levels of a system, particles in a box, if you like, then I can't put them all in the ground state at the lowest energy because Mr. Pauli will be unhappy. So to accommodate both Pauli and Heisenberg, what you do is you put two here, you put two here, you put two here, you keep on doing this till you have run out of electrons. By that time, you would have populated the energy level to a very high value, and this maximum energy up to which you would have populated, a little thought tells you that it is proportional to density to the power two-thirds. Therefore, a dense gas of electrons will have an enormous amount of kinetic energy, even at absolute zero of temperature. It has an enormous amount of energy because of motion. And this motion has nothing to do with heat. This motion is dictated by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. If a gas has internal energy, then according to first law of thermodynamics, it exerts pressure. And the pressure is proportional to the density to the power 5 thirds. And this pressure is non-zero and large even at absolute zero of temperature. And to repeat, this pressure has nothing to do with heat. The motions are quantum mechanical in origin. Now what Fowler said, all this was not calculated by Fowler. We'll come to that presently. But what Fowler said was that if you now go back to the previous view graph and calculate the kinetic energy of the gram of material according to that law, then that is greater than the attractive potential energy. A star will be able to escape and save itself from doom. Now, the remarkable thing, absolutely remarkable thing, is that Fowler, who was a senior professor in Cambridge, communicated this paper of Dirac to the Proceedings of Royal Society in August 26, 1926. And by November 3rd, he had advanced the following theory. And I would like to quote one extraordinary sentence from Fowler's paper. The black dwarf material is best likened to a single gigantic molecule in its ground state. On the Fermi-Dirac statistics, its high energy can be achieved in one and only way, in virtue of a correspondingly great energy content. But this energy can no more be expended in radiation than the energy of a normal atom or molecule in the ground state. The only difference between black dwarf material and normal molecule is that a molecule can exist in free state, while the black dwarf material can so exist 
under very high external pressure only. And at this stage, young Chandrasekhar enters the story. He was a second year undergraduate student in uh, Madras Presidency College. He learnt about uh, the year was 1928. The great German physicist Arnold Sommerfeld was visiting Madras. He had come to Calcutta to see Raman effect with his own eyes. And from Sommerfeld, Chandrasekhar learnt about the discovery of these new statistics. And in the Madras public library, yes, public library, he found Fowler's paper with this very prescient remark. And immediately worked out the complete theory of the stars. He calculated the pressure for the first time according to uh, Fermi-derived statistics and established this very fundamental result that the radius of the object decreases with increasing mass. If you go to Malaysia market, the one kilogram weight is this big, 10 kilogram weight is this big, a 50 kilogram weight is this big. Here the mass radius relation is exactly uh, uh, different, is very different. The radius of the star is proportional to one over the cube root of the mass and the mean density of the star is proportional to the square of the mass. But the important thing is this. Chandrasekhar asserted that all stars will find their ultimate peace as white dwarfs. When the supply of subatomic energy fails, as Eddington feared, the star will collapse. It will collapse and collapse and collapse till it reaches a density where Pauli's exclusion principle and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle will save it. And that is the radius it will have. So all stars will find ultimate peace as white dwarf. But within months after this, he revised his conclusion. And what a revision it was. He noticed that at the densities that obtained at the center white dwarf, A completely relativistic star had no radius, but it had a unique mass. And that unique mass was determined solely by fundamental constant. The same old combination, hc by g to the power 3 half, 1 over the square of the mass of the hydrogen atom, except this time it's multiplied by 0.19. This was 29.2 multiplied by 0.19, you get 1.4 times the mass of the sun. But what does this result mean? It doesn't mean anything. The star has no radius. So you develop an exact theory where you don't make the assumption that the star either obeyed Newton's laws, energy is p squared by 2m, or, or momentum is uh, mass times velocity, or a completely relativistic star where momentum is mass times c. You do the exact theory. It is hard work those days when there were no computers. But he spent the next one and a half years doing this. And the result of this calculation, which took a couple of years to do, was that the radius of the star as the mass increased deviated from the previous theory till finally when you reach this magical mass of 1.4 solar mass, the radius of the star went to zero. The radius of the star went to zero. So he concluded his remarkable papers, and I quote two of the last sentences of two of the most famous papers. First, for all stars of mass greater than a critical mass, the perfect gas equation of state does not break down, however high the density may become. And the matter does not become degenerate. An appeal to Fermi-Dirac statistics to avoid the central singularity cannot be made. For a star of small mass, the natural white dwarf state is an initial step towards complete extinction. A star of large mass cannot pass into the white dwarf state, and one is left speculating on other possibilities. And it is these other possibilities that we shall discuss in the next lecture, if ever there is one. Thank you very much.